Hello and welcome to Dr. Joe, a medical program where we discuss various health issues affecting humanity at large. And today we're going to be focusing on cervical cancer. What exactly is cervical cancer? Cervical cancer is cancer of the uterus. It affects the cervix, which is the outermost part of the uterus. What exactly happens when someone gets cervical cancer? Today we're going to focus on the signs and the symptoms of cervical cancer, the screening tests that are done in uh, diagnosing cervical cancer. We're also going to focus on the complications and also the management of cervical cancer. In terms of prevalence, cervical cancer affects about a quarter of all patients who've got cancers in the world got cervical cancer. That means 25% of people who suffer from cancer suffer from cervical cancer. It's the fourth commonest cancer in the world, both male and female. And in the developing countries, like in Zimbabwe and in Africa, cervical cancer affects, is the most common cancer. It affects more people than breast cancer. Remember last week we spoke about breast cancer and we said breast cancer is the commonest cancer that affects women in general, globally. But in Africa, cervical cancer is the number one cancer affecting women. And men, in general, it affects is the commonest cancer between men and women. So when you look at it, the importance of cervical cancer is this. Annually, about more than 500,000 people die of cervical cancer. And also we say more than 2 million people suffer from cervical cancer. And we've got more than 500,000 new cases of cervical cancer annually being recorded. And the reason why cervical cancer affects the developing countries more is because of poor screening techniques. In the first world countries, screening has been done so well and every woman gets screened in a systematic way and in an organized way. But in Africa, generally people don't get screened for cervical cancer. The reason being either poor socioeconomic status and also lack of knowledge. Most women do not know that there is cervical cancer screening or there is need for cervical cancer screening. So what is very important is for people to learn and to know the importance of cervical cancer screening because it's very simple there are two main ways of screening for cervical cancer one you can do what is called a pap smear just visit your doctor they can do a pap smear even nurses at local clinics can also do pap smears you can also do what is called a viac viac is also a very simple way of testing for cervical cancer it doesn't take five or ten minutes for someone to be screened for cervical cancer so i encourage all women to get screened for cervical cancer. Generally say if you are now above 30 years, you should be screened at least once in five years. We do a test, a VIAC or pap smear, and also can do a test for a virus called HPV or human papilloma virus. And also in the first world countries, nowadays there are vaccines. They're also available in the third world countries, but utilization and usage in the third world countries are very limited. There is a vaccine called Cervarix that is very important in prevention of cervical cancer. So I encourage all women, to go and get screened and to go and get tested for HPV and also to go and get vaccinated. The reason why we encourage you to be vaccinated against human papilloma virus, HPV, is because it's the commonest cause of cervical cancer. It affects 90% of women with HPV, especially strains 16 and 18. Eventually, 90% of all cervical cancer patients have got HPV strain 16 or 18. So it means that if you've got HPV virus, your chance of, contract, of suffering from cervical cancer are very high. So we encourage you to be screened and to be checked for HPV and also for pap smears. We say that if you get screened and if you get tested for HPV, your chances of contracting, HIV, of contracting uh, HPV are very limited and your chance of developing cervical cancer also go down. So we encourage you to go and get screened and checked for cervical cancer and on a routinely basis. Welcome back to the second segment of Dr. Joe. Today we are discussing cervical cancer. We have spoken about the causes of cervical cancer. Now I want to look at the risk factors of cervical cancer. Who gets cervical cancer and why? One, we talked about HPV or human papilloma virus. This is a virus that causes genital warts. So if you've suffered from genital warts before, your chances of suffering from cervical cancer are also increased. We say about 90% of all cervical cancer cases are also related to HPV, human papilloma virus. So please get screened for HPV. And also if you develop warts, get treated as soon as possible. The other risk factor is multiple sexual partners. If you're sleeping with a lot of men, your chances of contracting HPV are high and your chances of developing cervical cancer are also high. And also we say a partner with multiple sexual partners. That means your husband or your, your sexual partner, if he is having 
too many sexual partners, you're also at risk. Your risk is just the same as someone who's sleeping with a lot of partners. So make sure you talk to your partner, you behave well, and no, none of you is sleeping around, because if you sleep around, your chance of contracting HPV are high, and your chance of developing cervical cancer are also increased. The third thing that we talk about is early sexual debut. That means if you start having sex at an early age, for example, we say if you have sex before the age of, say, 16 years, the cervix would, wouldn't have developed enough at that point in time to contain that. The risk that you create for yourself by having sex early is so high in terms of you developing cervical cancer. So encourage young girls not to indulge in sexual activities when you're still young get married first, then you start uh, indulging in sexual activities. And then the last uh, risk factor that we talk about is multi-parity. Multi-parity means having plenty babies. Generally say if a woman has had more than seven babies, seven or more children, their chance of developing cervical cancer is four times higher compared to someone who's had one baby. So remember, multi-parity, like having several babies, is a high risk factor for developing cervical cancer. Then there are also so social factors that also uh, contribute to the development of cervical cancer. One, HIV. Patients who are HIV positive have got a high risk of developing cervical cancer. For example, I had a patient who was uh, 22 years old who developed cervical cancer at such a tender age because we say cervical cancer is a cancer that affects the elderly, usually about 45 years and going upwards. But she was only 22 and she developed cervical cancer because she was HIV positive. Because when you're immunosuppressed, then your chance of developing cervical cancer are also increased. So please be on the lookout, protect yourself and do not contract HIV. And if you contract HIV, get treatment as soon as possible. It helps reducing the chance of you contracting uh, HPV and also the chances of you suffering from cervical cancer. When it comes to the classification of cervical cancer, remember I talked about uh, grading of uh, a CA breast and classification of CA breast. When it comes to cervical cancer, there are mainly two types of cancer of the cervix. There's adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma affects about 90% of all cervical cancer cases. There are other subtypes that are less. Squamous cell carcinoma, up to 90%, uh, adenocarcinoma, up to 10%. Then there are other subtypes that affect just a few people. Those are the two main types of cervical cancer that you get. Then now when it comes to staging, remember when we talked about CA breast, we, we graded it, we staged it from stage zero to stage five. With CA cervix, we staged it from stage one to stage four. Remember, stage one is just carcinoma in situ. It means the cancer is just limited to the epithelium. It's very small. Usually by just doing a biopsy, the cancer disappears. Then stage two, it has grown a bit big, but it's still confined to the cervix. Then stage three, it has grown a bit more. Now it's involving the other pelvic organs, usually the uterus, or you can go to the fallopian tubes and stuff like that. Then stage four, this is now distant metastasis. It means the tumor has already spread to other parts of the body. It could be the abdomen, the liver, the lungs, the pleura. These are the common sites of spread of cancer of the cervix. So remember to get checked and to get screened early. When you get your VIAC done, when you get your pap smears done, you reduce the chance of contracting or developing cancer of the cervix. Because once you see aberrant cells, usually the biopsy that we take can actually help and cure the cancer of the cervix. Thank you for watching the second segment of Dr. Joe, where we're discussing cervical cancer today. Let's join us, join us after the break. We're going to focus on the treatment and uh, diagnosis of cancer of the cervix. Welcome back to the third segment of Dr. Joe. Today we're focusing on cervical cancer. We've spoken about the definition of cervical cancer, the risk factors of cervical cancer. Now I want to focus on the diagnosis of cervical cancer and the treatment modalities for cervical cancer. How do you make a diagnosis of cervical cancer? One, the diagnosis of cervical cancer is mainly made through a punch biopsy or tissue biopsy. We take a biopsy from your cervix, and then you send it to the lab, and the pathologist will tell us what exactly is in that tissue. If it's cancerous, then you've got cancer of the cervix. That's the gold standard for diagnosing cancer of the cervix. Yes, you have clinical symptoms that we're just going to discuss now, but they are not diagnostic. Some of the symptoms that you might suffer from or that you might experience when you've got cancer of the cervix, if you have any of these, please suspect you've got cancer of the cervix. One, you've got what is called contact bleeding. By contact bleeding, we mean that when you have sex or when you're douching, when you touch your cervix, you might start bleeding. If you have that, 
please suspect cancer of the cervix and visit the doctor nearest to you. Two, if you are having what is called intermenstrual bleeding, intermenstrual bleeding means you've got your period for the say you've got your period period at the beginning of the month then in the middle of your cycle you start bleeding again that's intermenstrual bleeding when you're having that suspect you've got cancer of the cervix and visit your doctor three you might have abnormal vaginal discharges usually that are not really responding to treatment because most discharges are just sexually transmitted infections but if they are not responding then please visit your doctor it could be in uh, cancer of the cervix then Lastly, the other symptom that you might suffer from is dyspareunia, pain when you're having sex. If you have pain when you're having sex, suspect cancer of the cervix. But in general, pain is not really diagnostic of cancer of the cervix. And I also want you to note that the early stages and the early forms of cancer of the cervix do not present with any symptoms, no pain, no bleeding, no discharge. Once you start seeing these symptoms, it means probably the cancer is already advanced. The other symptom that you might actually have is a growth. You might feel a lump on your cervix or there could be a small growth on the cervix. Once there's a small growth on the cervix, we take a biopsy of it and rule out cancer of the cervix. So if you've got any of these symptoms, please always suspect cancer of the cervix. And now when you come to the doctor and we suspect you've got cancer of the cervix, we take a biopsy, then we send it to the lab, it shows that actually you've got cancer of the cervix. We might need to do further tests, like an ultrasound scan of the abdomen, a CT scan of the abdomen, we might need to do a chest x-ray. These are some of the tests that we do to see whether the, the cancer is spread. It helps us in staging the cancer. Staging is very important in terms of management and also prognosis. Prognosis means the outcome of the d disease later on. So, if we suspect, if we know you've got cancer of the cervix, then we do an ultrasound scan, we do a CT, CT scan of the abdomen and the chest. If we see that the cancer has gone to the lungs, it has gone to the liver, it means you're now stage four. Most likely your cancer is now difficult to cure and your prognosis is also poor. So we say with cancer of the cervix, five-year survival rates in first world countries is above 80%. That means if you get tested early and we find out that you've got cancer of the cervix, your chances of surviving are very high. And if it's still CIN, cancer in carcinoma in situ, it means it's a small lesion. If you get tested from a pop smear and you find that you've got cancerous or precancerous cells and we manage it, your chance of survival can get even up to 100%. That means almost everyone with carcinoma in situ, which is managed well at an early stage, can actually survive for life without having complications of cancer. Now let's move on to the complications of cervical cancer. One, because of the mass effect could be having pressure on the bladder because the bladder is an organ that is just anterior to the uterus. So with the mass on the cervix could have pressure on the bladder means you might be peeing very frequently because of the pressure effects. Two, it can also erode into the bladder or into the urethra and then you can get what is called a fistula that means when you, are, you can't contain your urine urine is continuously leaking out and that becomes a social challenge i have had patients who've had challenges so at home with the husbands or at times even the in-laws chase them away saying you can't stay with a woman who's always thinking imagine staying around here and always leaking urine it's not a good thing so please get screened and get checked for cervical cancer early before complications arise the treatment of cervical cancer is mainly surgical resection. If you've got cancer at an early age, we just remove the part that is affected, usually just a bit of the cervix. We just take it out using a punch biopsy or an excisional biopsy. Two, if the cancer has grown a bit, maybe into the uterus or within the cervix, but it's a bit big, usually do what is called a TAH or a hysterectomy. Remove the uterus. Once you remove the uterus, we take away the cancer. Usually after that, you are cancer free. When the cancer is a bit advanced, we do what is called a hysterectomy. Hysterectomy means removal of the uterus. When it's more advanced, we do what is called a extended hysterectomy. We remove the uterus and the adjacent tissues, including the ovaries and stuff, so that you try and mop up as much as cancer cells out of your body as possible. After surgery, we can go further and add chemotherapy or radiotherapy. We can do both radio chemotherapy on top of the surgery depending on the extent of the tumor at times if the tumor is too extended or too extensive we might not even do the resection because probably you are not fit enough 
to with the, go through um, theater and surgery. At times, you just go ahead and do chemotherapy and radiotherapy, depending on your circumstances. Usually, treatment is also circumstantial. Unfortunately, uh, without surgery, your chance of surviving are very limited. But with surgery, your chance of survival are quite high. So when you do surgery, your prognosis is a bit better. And actually, you might survive for life without having any complications. Thank you for watching. Dr. Joe, meet us again next week. We are going to be discussing sexually transmitted infection. Remember to follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, like our page, and also like droptv.com. And remember to subscribe below. Thank you.